Welcome, brothers and sisters, to this week's sermon, and we are going to take a small trip to a little place known as the Institute. The Institute is rather controversial among the fans, largely because as a faction, their purpose is not entirely clear. Whereas the other factions have easily definable goals, whether it's the railroad freeing synths or the brotherhood seeking to destroy synths and synth technology, as it's regarded as a technological abomination, the Institute lacks a clearly defined goal. Not only that, the Institute regularly acts in contradicting manners, declaring, at times, a concern for the surface, while simultaneously actively harming the inhabitants of the surface. Much of this is chalked up to the faction being just a bunch of scientists just doing science things, and therefore, it doesn't have to make sense. But that is not the case. No. Sean, or Father, as I will refer to him for the rest of this video, leads the Institute and for a multitude of reasons is to blame for the Institute being the way it is. Father is a rather awful leader and he is largely responsible for the Institute that we get in game. So crank up the rads and let me show you why it's almost all Father's fault. First, it's important to establish that not everything that is wrong with the Institute or that the Institute has done wrong in the past is because of Father. Some of the first events that made the Commonwealth inhabitants fearful and distrustful of the Institute were the Broken Mask incident in 2229, where a third generation synth who was unauthorized to be allowed to act independently on the surface lost control and murdered several people in Diamond City. The second was the massacre of the Commonwealth Provisional Government an attempt by several groups of people in the Commonwealth to create a cooperative government. This was perpetrated by another Generation 3 synth in the 2230s after the Institute stopped sending representatives because of a lack of progress. Lastly, the Institute routinely abducted wastelanders to subject them to FEV experimentation and then release the resulting supermutants topside. These events caused the surface to be extremely distrustful of the Institute, and Father took that already poor general opinion of the Institute and said, hold my nuka dark. Father's main problems lie in roughly four distinct but interconnected areas. Father is a bad scientist, a rather awful trait for someone that is to guide and direct a body of scientists laser focused on scientific progress. Father is unable to be honest, whether this is with himself or others isn't always clear, but regardless, they have the same detrimental effect on the Institute. Father has major personal issues that he has not worked through well or in a constructive manner. This has an impact on his decisions and it jeopardizes the Institute and its goals. And finally, Father's proclivity to nepotism and familial preference also puts the Institute at undue risk, something that is inexcusable as a leader. Many of these points are mostly, but not entirely, reflected in three significant events. The first is the continuation of FEV research and the resulting disaster. The second is Father's persistence in creating a synth child modeled after him, who I'll be calling Synth Sean. And third, the decision to release the sole survivor from Vault 111, kicking off the story of Fallout 4. First, let's examine the evidence that shows that Father is not a great scientist. Let's give Father the benefit of the doubt here and say that, at one time, he was a good scientist. When speaking with the sole survivor, Father mentions that he had a specific gift when it came to the sciences. Therefore, it is unsurprising that he rose through the ranks after decades to become the director of the Institute. Although we are not aware of any of his specific scientific contributions, or even what division he worked in, many of his actions as director that we know of cast doubt on his claim to being a competent man of science. Although the Institute's FEV program began well before Father was even a member of the Institute, it would continue on to run for decades, from 2178 
when clearance was first given for FEV research, to 2286, when the last lead scientist to run the program, one Dr. Brian Virgil, destroyed the lab and escaped the institute, forcing the program to close. While the actions of Virgil do seem drastic, they become more understandable when you learn that the FEV program had been on autopilot ever since synthetic organics were successfully developed and spun off of FEV research. The research scientists were given no clear goals, and year after year their experimentation showed no deviation from the previous year's results. If you do not have clear research goals, properly planned and executed experiments, and clear negatable hypotheses, then you are not doing science. Forcing researchers to blindly run tests on groups of unwitting individuals with no clear purpose does not adhere to the scientific method, and it is no surprise that there is no progress in this program. Nor is it a surprise that the research scientists themselves are rather discontented. Father has a personal project that we will talk about more in depth a little bit later, but also shows Father's poor scientific approach. Father commissioned a project to create a child synth, something that has not been attempted before. This child synth was an exact copy of himself as a child, a frankly quite baffling move that was never given a reason to the researchers he ordered to work on the project. It is only justified once in a conversation with the sole survivor, where Father calls the decision a natural one since the Institute had records of his genetics and physiology. Once the project was largely complete, Synth Sean was put into an observation cell so that he was the first person the sole survivor would see when they finally come into the Institute. No matter how the conversation between Synth Sean and the sole survivor goes, Synth Sean gets distressed and has to be shut down by Father, at which point Father will declare that the interaction was fascinating but disappointing. Father mentions that they gained insights into their hardware and software based on the Synth Child project, and that it was a vessel for exploring the effects of extreme stimuli. This all seems like dressing, however, since Father asked the sole survivor several questions that hint his true curiosity with the project. He asks, But, I'll admit I'm curious. As a parent looking for a child, looking for the younger version of me, what do you think? Do you think you could love him like you would a real boy that is the closest we ever get to a mention of any sort of expectation from the project which itself is the closest thing we get to any sort of hypothesis to state things more clearly father wants to know can the soul survivor love father seeing as since sean is identical in appearance behavior and demeanor to the real sean albeit quite younger after the initial meeting with the soul survivor Father doesn't speak about the interaction between the Soul Survivor and Synth Sean again, until the end of the game, regardless of whether the player chooses to side with the Institute or not. Father will request that Synth Sean be put in the Soul Survivor's care, asking that Synth Sean either be given a chance to be a part of the future of the Commonwealth, or that Father hopes that Synth Sean and the Soul Survivor can have a chance at being a family. Since Father never elaborates to the scientists who created Synth Sean, and never explains to the sole survivor what scientific purpose the child serves, Synth Sean was only created under the guise of a scientific project to justify diverting resources for personal reasons. Few things are as anti-science as personal projects executed under the guise of an experiment that has no scientific basis. Speaking of bad experiments, let's look at the worst of all so-claimed experiments that Father has performed. The sole survivor was refrozen after Kellogg abducted infant Sean, left, as Kellogg said, as a backup. Decades later, the sole survivor would be unfrozen and start his journey to find his son, avenge his wife, or dick around building settlements. Father states specifically that he decided to thaw out the sole survivor to, and I quote, see what would happen, an experiment of sorts. His only saving grace is describing the action as an experiment of sorts, but it is still important to point out that releasing the sole survivor 
to just see what would happen is itself not an experiment. With how much care it takes to plan and execute valid scientific experiments, it is a rather sloppy choice of words from someone who knows better. And so now we have the last major point that shows why father is not a good scientist, a bad attribute to have for a community built solely on the advancement of science. The Institute at one time had a cybernetics program, and it appeared to be quite successful. The only known experimental specimen was Kellogg, the game's initial antagonist, whose body was augmented in several ways that allowed him to far outlive his natural lifespan. The very compelling success of these cybernetic enhancements even caused some jealousy amongst Institute scientists, who wished to also benefit from cybernetics just as Kellogg had. Father would single-handedly nix the entire program, however, discontinuing any and all development and leaving Kellogg as the only known example of just how impressive and beneficial the Institute's cybernetics research really was. So what could possibly justify the discontinuation of a wildly successful program? This belief that Father holds. Quote, the Institute is about preserving humanity, not some bizarre amalgamation of biology and technology. While Father does express some regret about eliminating the project, it wasn't enough to save the project or restart it at all because he believes that the Institute should not be involved with meshing biology and technology. Except that is exactly what the entire Generation 3 synth program is about. If inserting mechanical components into an organic body is an unholy marriage of technology and biology, then how is a synthetic organic body based on human DNA given organs and a neural system that match a human exactly given biological behavioral patterns that perfectly represent humans and lastly given either real or synthetic human memories that cause the sense to react, behave, and emote in a way that perfectly emulates humans, not the same. How is that not a mixture of technology and biology? That is using existing biology, like human DNA, biological elements like human behavior, and biological experiences like memories in a synthetic body created only through the advancement of technology. Considering cybernetics as an unacceptable mix of biology and technology is a remarkable point of hypocrisy, considering the Gen 3 synth project is arguably even more of a mix of biology and technology. Father just prefers one over the other and uses a hypocritical stance to justify it. Maybe there is a personal bias since his DNA is what makes the synths and he feels a connection to that project. But he is not objectively looking at the pros and cons of the cybernetics program and thereby coming to a conclusion to proceed or to kill it. He makes a purely opinion-based decision. It is even more condemning when we remember what was previously covered with the FEV program. Research that had not produced any tangible results for years upon years, yet was not revamped, halted, or stopped until the lead researcher destroyed the lab. Father is an awful scientist because he is not looking at the research on the merits of the progress being made and the advancements that are achieved. He pushes dead research and halts promising research because he feels so inclined. Is it really necessary that the leader of the institute be a good scientist? or even a scientist at all. Not necessarily, but just as the head of a science department in a university, for example, should have a good grasp of fundamentals of science and the scientific method, the leader of a technocracy who puts all of their resources into the advancement of science should at the very least understand good scientific methodology, experimentation, and productive research. Father seems to fall short of this standard. So while Father may not be a great scientist anymore, if he ever really was one, 
That is really the least of all the reasons why Father is an awful leader of the Institute, and largely responsible for the opaque goals and confusing actions of the group. Father has an inability to be honest, holds contradicting views, and uses either deliberate dishonesty or an apathetic pursuit of knowledge to justify his beliefs and actions. First is the most understandable of all deceptions. Father's health is failing as he has contracted an incurable form of cancer. He hides this from everyone, the sole survivor included, in order to focus attention on completing phase three and addressing the groups that oppose the Institute, namely the Brotherhood of Steel and Railroad. Still, since Father knew his end was close at hand, it would seem prudent to inform leadership so as to ease the transition which he knew was imminent. When Father comments on past events that involved the Institute, or confronts accusations by the sole survivor of atrocities committed by the Institute, he is fully unable to speak openly and honestly about the Institute's actions. Father will comment on the Commonwealth Provisional Government, or CPG, with the CPG being an attempt by groups in the Commonwealth to form a unified government, the Institute at the time was a part of these talks. Frustratingly little progress was made because of a lack of unity amongst the participants, and all talks and attempts to create a large governing body were halted when the Institute sent a synth to assassinate all members of the CPG. Although this event happened far before Father was director of the Institute, this is how he explains what happened. The Institute once tried to help create a stabilized Commonwealth government. It ended in bickering, infighting. It was a disaster. No. We look after our own now. Wait, that's it? That is all he says about the CPG? Now, was there disagreement and infighting? Yes. But then what happened, Father? Sending a synth to murder everyone that was part of the CPG is a huge omission when recounting the history of the CPG and how the Institute was involved. It's like referring to the Vietnam War as a colonial issue between France and Vietnam, without mentioning anything of the United States' involvement. The Institute killing everyone is a pretty important detail, and it is obvious that Father is purposefully misrepresenting the events to try and cause the sole survivor to question the things that they had heard on the surface. Father will defend the random acts of violence of synths, like the broken mask incident, by saying things like, Unfortunately, no advancement comes without occasional setbacks. Or, None have any true claim to nobility in this world. Those days are gone, but we are not the monsters we have been cast as. Father completely avoids accurately representing the missteps of the Institute, rather than being honest and acknowledging the things that they have done in a matter-of-fact way. He never recounts the events as they actually happened. When Father is forced to admit that the Institute has done some terrible things, he instantly pivots to a whataboutism. When the sole survivor tells Father that the Institute has done horrible things, this is how Sean responds. Yes, well, the world is not what it used to be. What about the people you've aided in order to get here? What atrocities have they committed? Father's intellectual dishonesty blinds him to be able to even admit in a matter-of-fact way what has taken place and where the Institute has gone over the line. This is interesting though because he had no problem speaking of the death of his own parent in such a detached manner. One of the first goals that Father has when meeting the sole survivor for the first time is to convince them that everything they had been told about the Institute by surface dwellers was a lie. Like this quote during the very first discussion. I can only imagine what you've heard, what you think of us. I'd like to show you that you may have the wrong impression. It has never been easy, and our actions are often misinterpreted by those above ground. Father is well aware of the reputation of the Institute above ground, no doubt at least partly due to their impressive intelligence network of watchers, synth infiltrators, and informants. Father routinely insists that the Institute is misunderstood, and their actions are misinterpreted by those on the surface. If asked by the sole survivor why Father even cares since the Institute is sequestered away from the rest of the Commonwealth, Father answers with, 
It does matter, though. If everyone sees the Institute as a villain, dangerous forces could align against us. If we can put the lie to such assumptions, we diminish that threat. We might diminish that danger by correcting the false perception that we intend some great harm to mankind. So, according to Father, the Institute is misunderstood by many on the surface, and it is important that this misunderstanding be corrected for the good of the Institute. By correcting the record as he sees it, he keeps groups on the surface from uniting against the Institute and become a legitimate threat. However, he directly contradicts his own statements in another conversation with the sole survivor. Father says, The Institute important. It really is humanity's best hope for the future, no matter what those above ground might think of us. If the soul survivor responds by saying, it doesn't matter what they think, it only matters what you do. The father admits that he agrees by saying, I am glad we see it the same way. That completely invalidates his earlier statements where he was insisting that the surface had a misinformed view of the Institute, and that this poor view of the Institute was important to rectify. Likewise, it is not just this one statement that shows how Father feigns concern for the Institute's image among the surface dwellers. The Institute is still replacing people in the Commonwealth, as evidenced by the ART random encounter, where it is very obvious the Institute is still actively replacing surface dwellers or convincing, and I put that in heavy air quotes, smart people to join the Institute, like in the case of Mr. Wallace, who holed himself up in his home and paid mercenaries or called on Minutemen to help protect him. The Institute refuses to take no for an answer, and Mr. Wallace either is forced to join the Institute or he dies. Another instance of the Institute acting deceitfully toward the surface dwellers is when Roger Warwick the patriarch of the Warwick family was replaced with a synth so that the bioscience division can run experiments on crops and the effects of ambient radiation on them. Roger was abducted, tortured, and the last step of the project as outlined by the bioscience division is to purge all evidence of their tests, which seems to imply the destruction of the settlement and the death of the Warwick family. All of these actions contradict Father's statements regarding how the Institute is maligned by the surface. In fact, Father's own explicit agreement with the sole survivor statement that it doesn't matter what the surface thinks, only what you, meaning Father, does, is the one statement that actually matches the actions of the Institute under Father's guidance. He doesn't actually care that the surface fears the Institute and considers it the boogeyman of the commonwealth. What Father does do and approves of is violent, harmful, and deceitful to the commonwealth, reinforcing their image as monsters. Father's dishonest words about how the surface misunderstands the Institute and that they aren't the awful people that they're made out to be is intentional deceit on the part of Father to attempt to ingratiate the sole survivor with himself and the Institute. Father's dishonesty and hypocrisy shines through yet again with the topic of Kellogg, the Institute's long-standing above-ground operative. Although Kellogg is first seen as a cold killer in the game's introduction, we come to find that he's a bit more nuanced, a jaded and broken man whose talents as a mercenary and lack of empathy and humanity is being abused by the Institute. Father agrees that the Institute took advantage of his vicious nature and tells the player that he only learned of the depth of Kellogg's violent nature after he had become director. Father even considers the death of Kellogg at the hands of the sole survivor as a form of personal revenge for the death of his deceased parent. Yet even though Father readily admits that the Institute took advantage of an emotionally detached killer to do their dirty work, and he himself didn't like Kellogg, and thought his death was a form of justice, Father unleashed Kellogg and a group of synths to massacre an entire settlement because they thought it had information that they wanted. 
University Point is a location that, by the time the player explores it in 2287, is nothing but a bunch of empty market stalls, destroyed buildings, and some remaining hostile synths. The story unravels as the player goes deeper into the settlement, but this empty and destroyed place once housed an entire bustling community, and when one extremely intelligent young woman found pre-war research on the creation of efficient nuclear reactor technology, she tried to sell the information to passing caravans. News of the discovery made it to the Institute through their network of informants, and Kellogg and a team were dispatched to go recover the research. It all ended in bloodshed and destruction, as things usually did with Kellogg, and all this happened under the direction of Father. While he does not ever discuss what happened at University Point himself, we know for a fact that Father was director of the Institute when these things unfolded. The young woman, Jacqueline Spencer, found the research in August of 2285, which was recorded in a terminal entry. The oldest known date for Father being director is July of 2285, just a month prior, again due to a personal terminal entry in the director's quarters. The actions at University Point lay bare Father's hypocrisy in several ways, and is probably the best single example of his dishonesty. Father used Kellogg, someone who he held a personal grudge against, who he acknowledges was a vicious person who directly caused an extraordinary amount of suffering, and with full knowledge of what Kellogg has done and was willing to do. When the sole survivor has a chance to directly confront Father about using a so-called psychopath, Father responds with, Would you have preferred that I turned him loose on the Commonwealth? At least keeping him on a short leash kept the collateral damage to a minimum. This is awful justification, since if Father really did object to what Kellogg did in order to complete his missions for the Institute, he had the authority to stop using Kellogg. With how much confidence the Institute puts in their coursers, a wildly unpredictable surface operator seems entirely unnecessary, and yet Father not only whitewashes previous incidents, he justifies the use of Kellogg by claiming to be doing the Commonwealth a favor by keeping him on a metaphorical short leash, all the while having been a victim of Kellogg's ruthless methods and harboring resentment for it. The events of University Point prove that the previous points of Father not actually caring about the image of the Commonwealth are true. While he goes to great effort to let the sole survivor know that the surface has the wrong impression of the Institute, he approves the mission to University Point, which predictably ends with brutality and death. And best of all, it is widely known that the settlement was destroyed by synths. One of the Diamond City guards can be overheard talking to another, saying, I'm telling you, it ain't just a story. University Point, that settlement on the coast, wiped out by synths. Father doesn't really care about what the surface thinks of the Institute, to a certain point as long as the negative image of the Institute doesn't coalesce into a unified threat, per his own words, then he doesn't care how people perceive the Institute. He also doesn't care what has to be done and how much suffering has to be inflicted on others to advance the Institute's goals. As long as whatever happens serves the immediate and future needs of the Institute, he will rationalize, hand wave away, and give performative, hollow speech to keep others from becoming too outraged. This is most clearly seen in how Father interacts with the sole survivor and reacts to being directly confronted with inconvenient questions. Since it seems clear that all this bold dishonesty is solely in the pursuit of bettering the Institute and pushing towards fulfilling the organization's goals, what are those goals exactly? The Institute is rather infamous at this point for having nebulous goals, and this is yet another example of Father purposefully obfuscating the truth in order to serve the Institute. I am not necessarily referring to goals like the completion of Phase 3, which has the objective of getting the Institute's new reactor online so that they have ample power for years to come. I am referring to the entire point of the Institute itself, and why it creates Gen 3 synths, why they have such an expansive intelligence apparatus, and why they interfere with the surface so often and drastically. Father is eager to tell the sole survivor the Institute's motto, Mankind Redefined. 
That is clever, and has a nice ring to it. The Institute's marketing department should be proud of that one. But what does it actually mean? Has the Institute fundamentally changed man? No. Has the Institute changed mankind itself? It doesn't appear so unless we consider the creation of Gen 3 synths as expanding mankind to include these new synthetic brethren, but no. The Institute rejects any notion of synths being people. Is it merely an empty platitude? I would argue no, because the change that is intended for mankind is not related to synths or cybernetic implants or transformative technology that could allow humanity to better adapt and survive the new post-war world. It is simply referring to the Institute being in charge. That's it. How do we know this? It's rather simple. Just listen to what Father says and watch what the Institute does. Father will tell the sole survivor that the Institute has been dedicated to the survival of humanity for over 100 years. How have they been helping humanity? Have they been helping neutralize threats on the surface? Have they come up with some technology that cleans up radiation? Have they been aiding the surface with food insecurity by giving away surplus food? No, none of that. They have been dedicated to developing the molecular relay so that they could hide better from the surface, dead end FEV experimentation that releases super mutants on the surface, and making robots that can do the manual work that they don't want to do. In their view, the surface is not part of humanity. It is a dead and desolate place with a doomed populace. This just confirms the truth I've always known. The Commonwealth is dead. There's no future here. The Institute, apparently, is humanity. And that ultimate goal that Father spoke of before was for humanity, aka the Institute, to retake and reshape the Commonwealth and beyond. Nowhere is this made more clear than when the player has helped the Institute by completing several missions and finishing Phase 3. Father tells the sole survivor, there has been too much posturing by too many groups. The world needs to know that we are in power and the Commonwealth is ours. Shortly afterwards, the sole survivor is given a script, which reads as... Our superior technology represents the best hope for the Commonwealth. Today, we activate our nuclear reactor, ensuring that we will persevere long after the world above ground has ceased to exist. Ensuring that mankind has a future. We have no desire to interfere in the unimportant details of your daily lives. We simply insist that you do not interfere with the Institute's operations. To do so would result in dire consequences. You may rest easy. Know that the future is in safe hands. That mankind will thrive under our guidance. In no uncertain terms, it is declared that the Institute, through their technology, will carry mankind forward. And again, let me remind you that when they say humanity, they mean themselves. The Institute is now in charge, and if you try and stop that, they will hurt you. This is and has been the goal of the Institute for some time now, at least since 2230, when they stopped cooperating with the surface and destroyed the best chance the Commonwealth had for coming together and unifying under a government. What is curious is that this and all other lies that we have covered so far are always espoused. No one drops the charade and speaks plainly about the real goals of the Institute, even after the sole survivor becomes the director. At no point does Father or anyone else for that matter actually acknowledge their obfuscation. Never does Father tell the sole survivor, I know I said this, but this is how it really is. Now some might argue that all this dishonesty, being in the service of the Institute, is actually a good thing for the director of the organization to do. After all, shouldn't his highest priority be for the good and advancement of the Institute? I would argue that this is a pattern of behavior that is overall destructive as every lie incurs a debt to the truth that at one point will come due, and as I will show later on, completely contradicts more of what Father does. However, 
there is one more lie that father espouses that contradicts a rigidly enforced belief that undergirds the entirety of the Gen 3 synth program. Father does not actually believe that synths are machines. The belief that synths are machines is hugely important, as it is the belief that causes the railroad to be diametrically opposed to the Institute, and it is how the Institute can justify the creation and use of synths and all the hard labor that makes sure that the cogs of the Institute continue to turn. The Synth Sean project that I mentioned earlier is the point where Father seems to finally break away from the dominant Institute belief. After Father's passing, the sole survivor can come into possession of a holotape where Father leaves his last message, one where he asks the sole survivor to take care of Synth Sean and where Father refers to Synth Sean as a boy. I have no reason to believe that you'll honor the request I'm about to make, but I feel compelled to try anyway. This synth, this boy, he deserves more. The same holotape will have a different message if the player chooses to side with the Institute in the end, and part of the holotape message will say, Both he and you deserve a chance to, to be a family. Calling Synth Sean a boy and considering the Soul Survivor and Synth Sean together a family is Father flat out admitting that, at least in his dying moments, that he does not believe that synths are just machines. It is highly doubtful that he believes synths were just machines his entire life up until the last moments before his passing. It is likely that he was harboring doubts and beliefs deep down for a while. To have the director of the Institute concede one of the greatest points of contention in the entire game to essentially be agreeing with their adversary, the railroad, is not to be understated. Saying such things out loud in the Institute is dangerous. Multiple times we hear of people telling each other that saying such things can land them in trouble. Insisting that Gen 3 synths are only machines gave the Institute justification for creating them using them as manual labor, and having complete control over them, even changing their appearance and memories. As soon as the Institute acknowledges that synths are indeed sentient, suddenly those practices become indefensibly unethical. Although all other lies were to justify the dirty work that needed to be done for the Institute, this one could actually be fatal to the organization as a whole, especially coming from the director. All of these examples are not even all the contradictions between what Father says and what he does, but rather the most poignant examples to illustrate the depth to which Father is willing to lie in order to manipulate and save face for the sake of the Institute, but also risk the image of the Institute on the surface and undermine their entire Generation 3 synth program, making him unfit to lead the Institute. His lies are largely responsible for the general confusion amongst players and the fan base about the goal and objectives of the Institute, since he both determines the actions of the Institute and is the primary source of information into the inner workings of the faction. No one is exempt from personal problems, be they small and largely inconsequential, or large with significant impacts on others. Father is no exception. However, some of his personal faults or flaws or however you want to describe them do have a substantial effect on the Institute. This once again shows that Father, as acting director, is overall a detriment to the Institute and largely to blame for their conflicting words and actions. Father struggles with feeling or understanding a range of emotions. He admits as much when talking to the sole survivor about feelings of anger, vengeance, and loss associated with the death of his deceased parent. I'm afraid I have very little experience with those emotions, having lived my life within the Institute. This is rather understandable, given the Institute's focus on scientific advancement above all else, but has a serious impact on Father's ability to work through a lot of negative emotions, which expresses itself in ways that are overall harmful to the Institute. The biggest challenge that Father grapples with revolves around a desire on his part to be a part of a family with the sole survivor. His familial circumstances in the Institute are unknown, but it is obvious that whatever he had growing up in the Institute was insufficient. 
father expresses his feelings pertaining to learning about the circumstances of his background by saying, For many years, I never questioned who my parents were. I accepted my situation, and that was that. With old age comes regret, and asking what if, more often. But what matters now is that you and I have a chance to begin again. It is obvious that his father got older and likely more aware of his precarious health situation with his incurable cancer, he felt compelled to do the only thing he could to answer his what if questions and growing regrets. He sent the order to release the sole survivor. Upon awakening from the cryogenic slumber, the sole survivor has really only a few simple goals, avenge their murdered spouse and find their missing child. Even for players that choose to spend the next 100 hours grinding for legendaries and settlement building, the Soul Survivor will eventually follow the decades old trail, with the real big break coming when Conrad Kellogg is confronted in Fort Strong. Kellogg must die. There is, unfortunately, no other choice in the matter. But this event is the first of several that show that this decision by father to release the Soul Survivor seriously jeopardizes the Institute and its capabilities. It was established that Father released the Soul Survivor as part of some kind of experiment. But when asked why Father chose now of all times to release the Soul Survivor, he says, Until I became director, I had no idea you were there. And after, there was initially no logical reason to do so. Certainly, it was no longer necessary to keep you suspended. I... well, I suppose I wanted to see what would happen. An experiment, of sorts. I had no idea what kind of man you were, you see. Would the Commonwealth corrupt you, as it has everything else? Would you even survive? Perhaps most curious to me, would you, after all this time, attempt to find me? And now I know the answer. It is important to ask exactly how Father expected the Soul Survivor to find him when they had hidden themselves away so well that no one on the surface except for Brian Virgil, knows how to get in. A key clue comes when Father insinuates that the confrontation between the Soul Survivor and Kellogg was purposeful and planned. I won't lie. It's no coincidence your path crossed his. It seemed a fitting way to allow you, us, to have some amount of revenge. Besides the obvious problematic logic of guiding his only parent, who he was deep down wanting to finally meet to the most dangerous man in the entire commonwealth, when looking at things from the institute's point of view, losing their most important surface asset is a setback. Even if we consider that father's long-standing issues with Kellogg due to what he did to his parent and other known atrocities provided a convenient excuse for father to eventually let him go, so to speak, this appears to be a unilateral decision since it is unlikely anyone else in the Institute cared about orchestrating a complicated and hidden operation to lead the sole survivor, of all people, to Kellogg. The death of Kellogg may have been Father's way of ridding himself of a resource that he apparently had a level of disdain for, even while fully exploiting Kellogg's particular set of skills. Or maybe it was something else entirely. Regardless, it set a chain of events in motion. The cybernetic implant recovered from Kellogg led to exploring some of Kellogg's memories and discovering that the Institute uses teleportation, a tightly held secret that no one else outside of the Institute knew. The memories also revealed the existence of Virgil, the now escaped former Institute scientist that grew sick of the dead end FEV experimentation and destroyed the lab to escape. The sole survivor eventually tracks down Virgil where a deal is struck. Virgil will help the sole survivor use the molecular relay, aka teleportation, to get into the Institute. If the Soul Survivor will get an experimental serum that will return Virgil to his human form. To infiltrate the Institute, a coarser chip, which interfaces with the molecular relay signal, must be obtained and this is only done by killing a coarser. Coursers are the Institute's elite generation 3 synths and their enhanced capabilities are used to great effect in tracking down runaway synths and bringing them back to the Institute. 
One courser in particular is in the process of doing just that, and killing an entire group of gunners on his way to recover a runaway synth, only to be stopped short by the soul survivor, who kills him to take his courser chip. So after killing yet another important institute asset, Virgil uses the chip to reverse engineer the relay technology, and the soul survivor has to use the help of one of three factions, the Brotherhood of Steel, the Railroad, or the Minutemen, all of which oppose the Institute, with the Brotherhood and Railroad diametrically opposed to the Institute and in seeking their destruction. The Soul Survivor is then able to use their homemade signal interceptor to hijack the relay signal and teleport into the Institute. All of this results in a very closed off first encounter with Synth Sean and Father. Seriously, to have the Soul Survivor meet Synth Sean, under the impression that Synth Sean was the real Sean, the Soul Survivor was thought out, somehow guided to fight and kill the Institute's main mercenary, track down and kill a valuable courser, have the relay technology reverse engineered by a former Institute member, and then have an enemy faction participate in the construction of the signal interceptor. I repeat, an enemy faction is given the reverse engineered technology to assist the sole survivor in penetrating the Institute. Once inside the Institute, through a series of tunnels and doors that seem to be constructed for the sole purpose of isolating the sole survivor from the rest of the Institute, the player is led directly to his encounter with the Shans. Through all of this, valuable and capable Institute assets are lost. Their technology and security is jeopardized and needlessly compromised so that father can meet the sole survivor and see how his pet project, Synth Sean, reacts. The Synth Sean project is also an example of Father's own personal issues negatively impacting the Institute. We covered how the researchers on the project questioned the purpose of the project in the first place, especially as it was meant to produce a synth that looked and acted exactly as Father did when he was around 10 years old. Father pulled some of the top minds in the Institute, including Dr. Lee and Dr. Bennett, and dedicated resources to a vanity project under the guise of pushing the Institute's limits. All of this was taking place before Phase 3 had been achieved, so resources, particularly energy, were being watched closely and strictly rationed, as evidenced by dialogue where Gen 1 synths are told to operate at lowered energy levels to conserve the facility's power. Both creating Synth Sean and releasing the Soul Survivor were all part of an elaborate attempt to create the family that never was. The family that was ripped apart by the Institute itself. Sean admits to as much should the Soul Survivor choose to leave the Institute and be branded an enemy by stating, I had hoped we could be something like a family again. I hoped you shared our vision for the future. That is the point because of the growing regret Father has harbored, which was likely exacerbated by his cancer. In addition, Synth Sean causes several researchers to really question whether what they are doing is right, and whether synths are really people. Dr. Lee speaks of moments where she and other researchers will forget for moments at a time that Synth Sean is not a real boy. He is such a distraction in that regard that she feels compelled to isolate him to the Advanced Systems Division so as not to disturb other scientists. Likewise, another researcher on the project, Janet Thompson, has a crisis of conscience where she questions if it's right for them to have made a child synth, since he will forever be a child, unable to grow up or have a family of his own. Janet is told by her husband to not speak of such things or risk disciplinary action for considering Synth Sean to be a person. Synth Sean is causing more than just father to doubt that synths are just machines. This personal project is doing more to undermine the claim and belief among the Institute that synths are machines, damaging the core justification for continued synth creation and use. And all of this comes at a hefty cost. By releasing the Soul Survivor and creating Synth Sean, he goes against his prime directive, which is to act in the best interest of the Institute. By wasting resources, wasting the time of Institute scientists, sacrificing capable assets, revealing one of the great secrets of how to find the Institute, 
and allowing opposing factions to obtain that sensitive information and technology. However, this is really only the tip of the iceberg and shows how on the one hand, Father is willing to commit atrocious acts for the good of the Institute, and yet will undermine all of that progress because of his driving desire to have the family that he always wanted. Father wastes no time in trying to convince the Soul Survivor to join the Institute, and as long as the player doesn't immediately reject Father's offers, or kill him, at the first meeting, the Soul Survivor will be given free reign to explore almost every corner of the Institute, and even be given the ability to use the molecular relay at will. As Father says, the Institute is as much of a home to the Soul Survivor now as it is to himself. That is a dangerous amount of freedom given to someone that has not demonstrated any allegiance to the Institute. To make matters worse, Father and others in the Institute are well aware that the Soul Survivor associated with and used factions like the Railroad or the Brotherhood of Steel to make their way to the Institute. This entire time, the Soul Survivor has nearly unlimited access to the Institute, its terminals, facilities, and personnel. After completing several missions and becoming more familiar with the Institute, Father will eventually confront the Soul Survivor about his relations with the Railroad. You know, Father, it's no secret that you worked with the Railroad in order to first reach the Institute. The depth of your involvement with them has been called into question repeatedly. I'm sure you can guess by whom. The question is, where do you stand with them now? Do you count them amongst your allies? Wouldn't this have been a pertinent question before giving the Soul Survivor full access to the Institute and able to teleport in and out at will? Father's complete unwillingness to do due diligence in this regard is the exact reason that the Soul Survivor can assist the Railroad or the Brotherhood of Steel in destroying the Institute. This appears to be a completely unhealthy and, frankly, unwarranted level of trust that Father has for the Soul Survivor something that becomes apparent should the player choose to betray the Institute and side with one of the other factions, where Father says, You had me fooled. I really believed you were on our side. Father is a danger to the Institute since he has an emotional attachment to the Soul Survivor that he struggles to understand, and that ends up blinding him to the potential threats posed by the player. And those threats do not stop at just letting the Soul Survivor into the Institute, Father falls into full-blown nepotism by unilaterally appointing the sole survivor as the new director of the Institute. In the lead-up to this, frankly, baffling announcement, Father will send the sole survivor on a series of missions, which culminates in an important operation at the Bunker Hill Settlement. This operation involves recovering a number of synths that are being protected by the railroad, and the player has the choice to follow the mission parameters or tip off the other factions. Failing the mission for the Institute offers illuminating dialogue from Father when he berates the Soul Survivor for having botched the operation and telling them, This was such a simple task. I just don't understand. I know you're capable of handling yourself. How can I expect you to represent the Institute if this sort of thing continues? Bunker Hill was to cement your place as a valuable asset to the Institute. It will now only raise suspicions. I will refrain from sharing the outcome with the Directorate for the moment. Things are already in motion that this would only derail. A single courser could have done that job by himself. You must see how disappointing this is. The chances of failing this mission were so astronomically low that yes, it does matter. Father is upset because it will make his soon-to-be announcement of the appointment of the Soul Survivor to Director look pathetic, since failing the mission would raise suspicions and call the sole survivor, and by extension, Father's competence into question. It is interesting to note that Father was trying to use this mission as an easy win, since the odds had been calculated to be so heavily weighted in favor for the Institute that failure was not even seen as remotely possible, and that a single courser could have completed the mission himself. And somehow, this was meant to be a feather in the Soul Survivor's cap? A mission extremely likely to succeed that could be completed by a courser was meant to illustrate 
the Soul Survivor's abilities and loyalty to the Institute? It is obvious that this was an ill-conceived attempt to somewhat bolster and validate Father's surprise announcement that he would be calling the Soul Survivor to replace him as director. Even the other department leads are gobsmacked by this decision, decrying it because the Soul Survivor is not a member of the Institute, nor is he a scientist. And these are definitely valid concerns. The Soul Survivor has knowingly cooperated with groups hostile to the Institute, was given a few easy missions to prove his capabilities and loyalty, which, by the way, can be failed with seemingly no consequence, after which he is proclaimed to become the next director by his own son, someone that has proven to make poor decisions due to his desire to have a relationship and some sort of family with the sole survivor. As if the nepotism wasn't already clear, some of the division leads will stage a small mutiny in which the sole survivor is tasked with defusing the situation. Rather shockingly, as Father describes the situation, he asks the sole survivor to deal with the mutineers by saying, Don't assume this is a bluff. These men are proud. They might well be prepared to die for their cause. Hopefully violence won't be necessary. But in the end, you must do what's best for the Institute. You are telling me that after Father unilaterally appointed his own dad to become the next director, someone who has known connection to outside groups and has only just learned of the Institute and barely done anything to prove their allegiance, that the sole survivor gets the green light to kill the department heads that are upset with his decisions, and that's totally fine? Is this really what's best for the Institute, as Father directly said? Or is this what is best for Father's wishes and familial desires? The blatant favoritism for the Soul Survivor is the capstone of the monument that is Father's incompetent leadership. Now, after all of this, I want to be fair to Father. Not every single awful action or bad thing about the Institute was his fault. The initial FEV experiments that were kidnapping surface dwellers, turning them into super mutants, and then releasing them topside to cause chaos did not start with Father, but he didn't end it either. He also wasn't in charge during the broken mask incident, which was the result of doing Gen 3 field testing too early. Lastly, the massacre of the CPG was also before Father's time, so the Institute was already seen as a malevolent group who were building human-like machines, all the while people were disappearing for no discernible reason. The Institute's image as the boogeyman of the Commonwealth was established before the first confirmed date of Father as the director, which was in 2285. But he did nothing to put an end to these practices that gave the Institute that image. In fact, he reinforced it by continuing FEB, still engaging in replacements and abductions, and going so far as wiping out entire settlements for some pre-war research information. A good Institute director, maybe not objectively good, but good for the faction, would accept the reality of the past and justify the current questionable actions by claiming that it is necessary for the good of the Institute. They would justify it by selling the true goal of the Institute, to change the world with their technology. But that could only happen with them in control. They could talk of a future where humans were freed from the shackles of menial labor, and the synths would allow mankind to engage in their true passions, to devote all time to advanced science, art, and technology. The leader would sell that idea, this philosophy, to the player, and use the means justify the ends logic to explain why they have to do awful things like wipe out settlements or abduct people. Then it would be on the player to decide if, first, they agree with this ideology, and second, whether they think the ends really do justify the means. And a good leader would not let his personal problems stand in the way of the Institute achieving these goals. All of these points we discussed is not what makes the Institute bad, however. Or, let me rephrase that. The Institute engages in many things that can be considered bad and morally wrong, but they are more than that. The Institute's goals are vague and never plainly described. Their methods are reprehensible and contradictory. 
The organization is on the one hand an incredible example of scientific progress, and on the other, completely aimless. All of these things are simultaneously true, which causes confusion amongst fans when talking about the motives and actions of the Institute. While the Institute staked its claim as an organization hostile towards those that live in the Commonwealth in the 2230s, it is father that is to blame for what makes the Institute so frustrating to unravel and assign motives. Father is willing to engage in the morally bankrupt practices of murder, kidnapping, and enslavement of a sentient group of synths while simultaneously whitewashing the past, downplaying the present, and justifying enslavement. While Father seems all in on getting his hands dirty for the betterment of the Institute, he is undermining all of that because of his strong desire to have some sort of family with his remaining parent. He wastes time and resources to create a synth child with no regard for the consequences of his actions to fulfill some sort of fantasy. He places so much trust in the Soul Survivor that the Institute is handed to any faction of their choosing on a silver platter, and submits to pure nepotism by appointing the Soul Survivor to become the new director even though it causes a literal mutiny that can result in bloodshed. Whatever terrible acts that Father justifies as being in the best interest of the Institute, are completely unjustifiable by anyone as soon as he invalidates that progress with personal ambitions. The Institute is confusing because Father is confused. The Institute lacks clear direction and meaning because Father struggles to choose one direction. The Institute, well, sucks because as a character, Father kind of sucks too. So next time you become frustrated by the Institute's writing, just remember that most of that rests on the shoulders of your son, the director of the Institute, and the father of synths. But hey, if it makes you feel better, just tell everyone that he takes after his mother. Thank you brothers and sisters for making it this far, and an enormous thank you to my patrons, who are doing Adam's work by supporting me, allowing me to take the time to provide content like this. If you want to chat with me, I have a Discord, so come swing by. If you appreciate my content and want to show support, you can join my Patreon and give tithe to Adam and reap his rewards. I won't do a comment to highlight this video due to a lack of time, but expect it in the next long video. Take care of yourselves. Let Adam guide you, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>